who does he save? Those who come to God through him. The work is finished. We must come now to him. He is the door. He is the way. He didn't say come to church, but come to God. We've established uh, in last week's profound message that um, the, the first verses in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews um, declare that um, Melchizedek is actually Jesus. So far the book of Hebrews is explaining who Jesus is to the Hebrews. And um, now that these dots have been connected between the Old and the New Testament. Um, Paul is going to continue in the rest of chapter 7 to, uh, to expound on this and to, uh, to deepen this. As he has said in previous uh, chapters, uh, this is meat, this is um, for the mature. So um, I want to, to dig into this further. And um, yeah, as, as also last time, there are beautiful uh, connections between Old and New Testament and we get actually to understand why God has inst instituted certain things um, in the Old Testament um, under the law of Moses. Um, so we continue to read in uh, Hebrews 7 um, the verses uh, 4 through 10. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes to, of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came or come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abram, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If we uh, back up to um, chapter 3, there in verse 10, Paul writes, Consider the Apostle and High Priest Jesus Christ. And here, in verse 4, he says, Now consider how great this man is. This man referring to the priest after the order of Melchizedek, none other than Jesus. He talks at the surface about Melchizedek, but he's really talking about Jesus, the same person. As, as I said before, this is what the book of Hebrews is about. It's explaining Jesus uh, to the Hebrews. Um, so we read uh, in uh, Genesis uh, 14, in verse 19 and uh, 20, we read last time, that Melchizedek blessed Abram and that Abram gives him tithes. Um, Hebrews 7 declares that this is a tenth uh, of the, the spoils of the battle. So that confirms also the position of Melchizedek, because to whom do you give tithes? Uh, it's not to the Levite, it's not to the church. Um, that's um, uh, not how it's intended. If we read Genesis 28, verse 22, it says there, um, this is about uh, Jacob, uh, um, and this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So Jacob vows a tenth to the Lord. To the Lord. 
In Leviticus 27 verse 32 we read, And concerning the tithe of the herd of, or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Tenth is holy unto whom? Unto the Lord. Now, the Hebrew reader might say, yes, but we also pay a tenth to the Levites. So how does this make Melchizedek better? And the answer uh, is given here, because as we find in many of Paul's writings, he anticipates the questions that might arise and answers them right away in his writing. He says here, when Abram paid tithes, Levi, the tribe of Levi, did not exist yet. Of course, Abram was the father of Isaac, who was the father of Jacob, who was the father of the twelve sons, among whom Levi. So, genetically, Levi was still in the loins of Abram. It was two generations prior. That is what he's literally saying here. So, in a way, the Levitical priesthood in the loins of Aram was paying tithes to Melchizedek. That's the point he's making here. So, um, verse 8 then tells us that the uh, Levitical, um, the Levitical uh, priests who receive tithes, they are, are mortal, they die. But it says of Melchizedek, it is witnessed that he liveth. Now that's a very interesting statement. It's witnessed that he liveth. Of whom it was witnessed that he, he lives. Uh, um, and there were still um, eyewitnesses around um, when this was written. That was, um, uh, of course, Jesus. Melchizedek was... Uh, yeah. Abram's days, so uh, that was considered to be ancient. Um, but it says here clearly, it is witnessed of him that he lives. This talks about Jesus, which is yet another reference that Jesus is Melchizedek. Um, verse 7 then says, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So Melchizedek blesses Abram. This means that Melchizedek is greater than Abram. Um, and uh, back to Genesis 14, verse 19, it says that this, uh, we read that, that this blessing is not just a simple wish, but it is an authorized declaration of the Most High God. And none other than Jesus can speak um, like that. So, uh, again, profound. Paul continues to show the Hebrew reader that the Levitical priesthood is not the ultimate. It's a mere shadow instituted in expectation of the fulfillment of the priesthood of Melchizedek in Jesus. He makes it clear in the following verse, verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Yeah, it's a, uh, a clear point. If perfection would come through the Levitical priesthood, there would not be need for another priesthood. Yet God declares after the Levitical priesthood, after it had been installed in the timeline of history, after that, he says that there would be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Yeah, of course, Melchizedek was before the Levitical priesthood, was in Abram's days. But then, much later, um, when the Levitical priesthood is installed, God still declares that there will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That is declared in the Old Testament. That is important because... It's not something that um, um, Paul is now constructing um, um, to just to prove a point. No, he, he shows from Scripture this has been the plan all along. And he's referring here to Psalm 110, as he has done a few times before in um, the Epistle to the Hebrews. 
In Psalm 110, verse 4, it says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we looked at this psalm a while ago. Obviously, okay, it's written, of course, after, way after Abram, way after Melchizedek. But here we have the declaration. Uh, the Lord is speaking. Uh, it says the, the Lord um, in verse 1, and the, um, the Lord says to my Lord. Uh, and um, it doesn't come out in English, but um, in Hebrew it says, Yahweh says uh, unto Adon. Adon is the singular ver version of Adonai. Adonai is plural. So, uh, um, Yahweh, God the Father, says to the Son. That's what it means. Um, we can see it, uh, at least in the King James Version, uh, the Lord is fully capitalized, speaks unto my Lord, and the Lord is, has only capital L. And there you know that it has a different um, source word. So um, that's, that's what we read in verse 1 of Psalm 110. And in verse 2 it says that it's out of Zion, that's Jerusalem. We know that uh, Melchizedek was king of Salem. And we know also that Jesus will rule out of Jerusalem. And uh, it also says that um, uh, he sits at my right hand. This is also what is declared about Jesus and um this will be repeated in Hebrews chapter 8 in verse 1 as well. Uh, and then again in verse 5, the word Adon is uh, repeated. So all this shows that something is lacking in the Levitical priesthood. Because God would never uh, install an unnecessary priesthood um, if, if there was already a perfect one. So the people receive the law under the Levitical priesthood. It's associated to the law of Moses. Whereas the priesthood of Melchizedek is associated with Abram, not with Moses. It was way before Moses. So we continue then in verse 12. It says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The priesthood changed... Uh, it's clear also from Psalm 110 that God wanted it to be changed, but it was also necessary that it, it would change. And as a result, it would also change the position of the law. So not the validity of the law, but the position of the law. So that same law, if we look at it, that would actually disqualify Jesus as high priest. But that too was necessary in order for him to be an eternal high priest. Jesus could not be a priest under the Levitical, uh, in the Levitical line, eh, under the law of Moses. Then he would not be a, an eternal priest. It would be the same as all the other priests before him. So uh, what does it say in uh, verse 13 and 14? For he, he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to an other tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. The tribe of Judah, the tribe of Jesus' lineage, had nothing to do with Aaron's priesthood. And according to the law of Moses, Jesus could never be a priest. There had to be another principle. And there was, even before the law of Moses. And that is then explained in verse 15 through 17. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Again, God's declaration that the Messiah is from another order of priesthood. And again, Psalm 110 verse 4 is quoted. That's important. It's quoted a lot, this psalm, um, because that makes the, the link to the scriptures that were known in those days uh, and that were accepted 
and it explains the why and, and how it has been fulfilled. It's important that the Hebrews recognize this in their own scriptures. And it's important for us to see that God had planned everything in detail ahead of time. You are a priest forever. And this could never be said of any other priest. All of them served for a limited time and died. I continue in verse 18. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we, are draw, we draw nigh unto God. The law is set aside so that our relationship with and access to God can be established. This is the better hope that it speaks about. Now, you would say, not so fast, the law set aside, what are you saying now? Um, of course, the law is, uh, is still valid. As I said before, the position of the law has changed, not its validity. The law sets God's standard. The problem with the law is that it cannot give the power to keep that standard. That's why it says the law made nothing perfect, because it's weak and unprofitable. It is when it comes to saving my soul or giving me power over sin. It can't. It diagnoses the problem, which is very important, but it provides no cure. It's like you go to, to the doctor for a standard uh, uh, research and uh, he tells you there's a massive problem. You have a, a very bad illness. Um, that's not good news at all, of course. And the first thing you would ask is, what can we do about it? And the one thing you don't want to hear is him saying nothing. And that is exactly what the law does. It exposes, it diagnoses the problem, but it provides no solution. And therefore, it is weak and unprofitable. Only Jesus can save us from our sin problem. He is the better hope. It speaks then of disannulling the law. And that word, disannulling, is athetesis. And it's the same that is used in um, the next chapter, Hebrews 9 and verse 26, where it says, uh, He appeared to put away sin by his sacrifice. And putting away is also disannulling. So it's really removing. And the um, the annulling of the law is absolute, just as the putting away of sin is absolute. The better hope is Jesus. He is the way to the Father. The law cannot draw you near to God. Through the law, of course, we can establish a legal relationship with God, but not a living relationship based on grace, grace given in Jesus. This is the point that um, the text here makes. Um, if you only focus on the legal aspect, that is what the law is about, its legalities, then you, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved. You will maybe do all kinds of things to keep that law or to, um, to compensate if you uh, break it, which uh, the whole sacrificial system, of course, was set up for but it ultimately does not save you. And only Jesus can. This is the point. Only the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, none of the other priests or high priests could ever achieve this. So it's said in this perspective that even today Jews want to rebuild the temple and reinstate the Levitical priesthood and all these things, and uh, also many Christians are very enthusiastic about it. Now, of course, we know these things must come to pass, but we must also we know also that blindness happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So uh, it's it's maybe something that um, we we are in a, in a sense we like to see happen because we know it has to be fulfilled, 
and that means that um, this will be the end of the age. Um, but at the same time, it's very sad, of course, um, especially on the individual level of um, of you know, people who, who believe and work on these things. It says that the law has weakness in verse 18. It does not provide strength. And it was not meant for that. What it does provide is a standard. A standard by which man could measure his moral status. The law reveals sin. But it is Jesus, and only Jesus, who can take away the wages of sin. And even the accusations against us. Now, in uh, Romans 8, verse 2 and 3, it uh, speaks about the same thing. It says there, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. It's really saying the same that... Uh, I also just explained here from Hebrews chapter 7. Then uh, the text continues to speak about the superiority of, um, of our high priest, our eternal high priest. Um, Hebrews 7 verse 20 and 21. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we're still comparing the Levitical priesthood with that of the order of Melchizedek. The lesser and the greater, the one linked to the law and the one linked to grace. And again Psalm 110 is quoted, where God has sworn an oath to establish his son as high priest. And uh, as we also saw in the previous chapter about this, God cannot lie. Well, God cannot lie, period. Um, so, but this cannot be said of any other high priest, as they were appointed by heredity, not by an oath. Um, I continue with verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. The Levitical priesthood had no one to guarantee the people's side of the covenant. Um, so it failed continually. But the new covenant, the better testament, has a co-signer, a guarantor, uh, on our behalf. We saw this also last time with um, when I wrote, read from Genesis, um, the confirming of the covenant by this smoky furnace and this burning lamp. There is a cosign, that's Jesus. And um, uh, so, actually, from this also, uh, if you look at this, this story in Genesis 15, uh, where God confirms this covenant, we see actually that the new covenant had already been established before the old covenant. So, the words new and old um, are maybe a bit confusing in, in the sense of. Uh, uh, Sequence, sequentiality of it, but um, it's actually so. And we know this also from other scriptures where it says that Jesus is the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth. It's not plan B that God came up later because the other one failed. It is. Uh, it has always been the plan from the beginning. But it's a better covenant because it depends on what Jesus did and not on what we do. And that's the whole difference. He is the surety. Yeah. And we are not. I continue in verse 23 through 25. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continued ever, had an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever lived to make intercession for them. Priests came and went. They grew old and they died. And some were better than others. It was ever-changing. But Jesus' priesthood had 
this man, as it is referred to here, is unchangeable and continues forever. Death has not stopped him, as he sits at the right hand of the throne. That's Psalm 110 verse 1. And this permanency makes that he can save to the uttermost, as Paul writes. It does not say from the uttermost, although that's also true, that he can save to the uttermost. Because he is our high priest forever. He can save forever. There's no ending to it. Who does he save? And that's told here in the, in the text. Who does he save? Those who come to God through him. The work is finished. We must come now to him. He is the door. He is the way. He didn't say come to church, but come to God. What an encouragement to know that he lives forever, to pray for us, to continually represent us for the Father, so that we can draw near through him. Now, finally, here the point is made that there, there is and cannot be anyone else who is qualified or who would be qualified to take up this role. Verse 26 through 28. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh man high priests, which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrate forevermore. This chapter, chapter 7, began with, For this Melchizedek. And it ends with praising, Jesus, the Son of God. And in between, all the dots have been connected. He is the eternal, unique high priest. None of the Levitical high priests had the character of the Son of God. Holy, it says, harmless, undefiled. And then it says, separate from sinners. It is meaning because he is not sharing in their sin. He has become higher than the heavens. And this unique position uh, made that he did not need to offer up sacrifices for himself, for his own sins first, which the other priests needed to do every day. And then follows something that makes him even more unique, namely he offered up himself. Jesus was both the, both the priest and the sacrifice, not just a sacrifice, but the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. Under the law of Moses, the priests were always men with weaknesses. But Jesus is a son who has been perfected, consecrated forever. Jesus is perfectly qualified to be our perfect high priest, perfected forever. Amen. Amen.